Welcome to yet another in the series of Perth US Asia Center Foreign Policy Conversations. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Ms. Amanda Lacaz, who is the CEO and Managing Director of Linus Corporation. I think to most of our community, at least here in Western Australia, Amanda needs no introduction. She was the, the hands down star of our annual In the Zone conference, uh, which was taken, took place in October of 2019. Uh, and which focused on a, a, an issue of growing importance, not just to Western Australia, uh, not to Australia more broadly, but to the entire region, entire globe, and that is critical materials, rare earth. I think many of you know, uh, Linus Corporation is the only commercial scale rare earth processing facility and company outside of China. Uh, and as such, discussions around the business of Linus have taken on geostrategic implications. And that has meant that Amanda is very much in demand, not just on the business sense, but for all of us trying to think through the future of our region and a whole range of issues. Uh, prior to taking over her current role in 2014, Amanda was Chief Executive Officer of uh, Commander Communications, Executive Chairman of Orion Telecommunications, and CEO of AOL7, and a long list of other uh, corporate roles that, I, that uh, if I, if I listed them all, I don't think we'd have time to get to critical materials. But we're really pleased to have Amanda with us to share her perspectives. Amanda, thank you for your time today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Gordon. Now, I'm going to jump right in uh, and frame our conversation in a bigger picture, and that is on supply chain resilience. Uh, and, and as we speak right now, there is intense focus on, on the Australian trade relationship with China. Uh, and there is a, a shifting national debate about diversification, 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 just because of the risk of having all our eggs in one basket. But this year has seen many different crises that have interrupted global supply chains in some way or another. In many countries, including Australia, this has led to increased attention on developing resilient supply chains for critical commodities in particular. I'm wondering if you might just take a moment to, to walk us through how rare earth minerals fit into that broader debate about supply chain resilience. Sure. So I, I, I'm sure many people who are on this call will, will be very familiar with this. But as a reminder, rare earths are used in many of the key growth sectors in industry and indeed even in our daily lives. Um, that includes electrification of transport, renewable power solutions, electronics, and automation. Um, those types of technologies are critical for consumers and the way we want to live our life and the way that we want to manage our environment. They're critical for industry because these are the areas that are driving industrial growth. Therefore, they're going to drive economic development. Um, quality of life for all of us. You know, it still remains that the most powerful thing I can do for the people who work for me is make sure they have a job. Um, and of course, you know, it's always the thing that is in the headlines, but defence applications are, are, are users of these materials and these technologies as well. And, you know, as we talk about the things which have disrupted supply chains over the past year, really what it's proven is uh, and it's not geography specific it's just proven that if you have a singular supply chain if it is not diversified you are vulnerable and you are vulnerable to geopolitics but you are also vulnerable to natural disasters or health challenges or otherwise so the west has effectively outsourced its manufacturing to asia and particularly China, for probably the last two or three decades. Um, and they've done this either seeking to source material from the Chinese in particular, or they have insourced their manufacturing into China. So if you think about many of the things that we use, particularly electronics or, you know, the most recently, where's Tesla building its next big factory? in China. So, you know, I think that, you know, Western governments are recognising the need to reassess this because economic prosperity in the West demands that we do. 
And when we talk specifically with China, uh, the Chinese government has demonstrated that they are prepared to utilize economic weaponry uh, uh, for, for diplomatic purposes. So the rare earths market, which is absolutely dominated by China, um, although we are proud that we've broken the monopoly um, over the past five years. Um, it is a small market. Uh, it is easily manipulated and it, it is manipulated, but it is truly critical if the West wants to be anything like self-sufficient in all of these critical areas and particularly if the West wants to continue to enjoy economic prosperity. Well, thank you. I couldn't have asked for a, a more concise, deep dive into the kind of the context for the rarers themselves, but I'm gonna ask you to go a little bit deeper uh, just because uh, when, when you say rare earths or even critical materials, I don't know that, that people who are not specialists and that <laughs> includes myself actually understand it. So if I, I've got this correct, you know, rare earths aren't a single commodity, but a group of related mineral resources used across the full technology ecosystem. Uh, and I do understand that Linus has become, and you just mentioned it, an established presence as one of the world's most important suppliers of so-called light rare earths. Um, uh, what are your plans for, for moving into a broader array of rare earth products, uh, maybe heavy rare earths? And I, again, you're gonna have to explain what that means to me and what the implications are. Uh, and then more importantly, can you tie that back into this question of supply chains that you just discussed? Sure. So rare earths, and it's a great branding because they're not all that rare in the earth's crust, but they are very rare to be found in sufficient concentration to be economically viable to, to, to mine and to process. Um, there are 17 elements which are generally grouped together as rare earths and some are light rare earths, some are medium rare earths and some are heavy rare earths and basically that's just as the atomic number goes up as you go from left to right on the periodic table, the ones on the left are light and the ones on the end are heavy. And in each of these groupings, the elements have slightly different um, characteristics. They're valuable because they're reactive metals. Um, some of them are catalytic, some of them are optical, and some of them are magnetic. The sexy rare earths today are the magnetic rare earths. They're the ones which are being used in a lot of those technologies we're talking about. So if we talk about a high performance magnet, which may be used, for example, in the drive train in an electric vehicle, um, it will have an NDPR, or an NDFEB magnet, which is using two of the light rare earths, neodymium and praseodymium. But every single one of those requires just a touch of the heavy rare earths, the magnetic heavy rare earth material, dysprosium or terbium. And what that does is it makes sure that the magnet continues to work even when the temperature gets high. Now, our rare earth deposit is at Mount Weld in Western Australia, and it is generally recognised as being, you know, if not the best, certainly one of the best in the world. And it is unique because it is rich in both light rare earths and heavy rare earths. So generally deposits will either be preferenced significantly towards lights or heavies. And interestingly, in our Mount Weld deposit, we have as much contained heavy rare earths as in some of the pure play heavy rare earth projects. So up until now, the only place which separates heavy rare earths are separators in China. And so about 5% by volume of what we produce is a heavy rare earths compound, but we actually sell that to a separator in China who then on sells it. And this has been really, I call it, you know, a fabulous get out of jail free card for many Western consumers. Because even when people say, well, look, really you should diversify your supply chains, they say, that's all well and good, but I still have to go to China for my dysprosium. So if I've got to go there for my dysprosium, I might as well go there for everything. And so with Linus, 
our next step in terms of broadening our product range is to separate our own heavy rare earths. So we are, the, we, we, we believe, the only company outside of China that not only has the feedstock, but also has the know-how on how to do that. And once we do that, there can be no more excuses for, but I really need to go to China. And so once again, it really offers a great opportunity for end users to take steps to build more resilience into their supply chains. I, I have to confess that one, I had to practice saying dysprosian before this call. <laughs> and two, that by the time my children read grade four, I could no longer help them with either uh, their math homework or the periodic table. So I really <laughs> appreciate your, your very clear ex, uh, explanations. Um, you reference your, your, your mine here in Western Australia, Mount Weld. Um, obviously, Australia more broadly has considerable reserves. Could you take a moment and just step back and look at Australia's um, value proposition more broadly when it comes to these rare earths? So I would like to frame this in terms of the types of ways that the materials are used. So as a woman of indeterminate age, um, but with you know a, a more than a slight green tinge, of course, I would like to think that I make choices which are going to contribute to better environmental outcomes than maybe I would have made even 10 years ago. Um, and so I may say, well, instead of um, a, 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 an internal combustion engine, a petrol vehicle, I would like to at a minimum move slightly up the ladder to a hybrid, say for example. Now I want to make that decision confident that it is from cradle to cradle, actually is the best way to think about it, but it is a good decision. So that the life cycle cost of me making that decision is a good decision. It's not just in the finished product, but it is right from you know, taking this non-renewable resource out of the ground. Are we treating it with respect, with care? Are we you know, monetizing that in a responsible way? So we would like to talk about Australia being a source of responsible rare earths. The sourcing and process is done in a way that is responsible and which is environmentally sound. And it is one of the reasons why we offer for our customers life cycle analysis, which gives a cost for processing, compares it to the alternatives. It's one of the reasons why we offer a certificate of analysis so that people can see the, the products from mine right through to magnet. Um, and we think that that's important, not just for our direct customers, but actually for the ultimate consumers of these materials. I think Australia also has um, a lot to offer the world in terms of minimal sovereign risk, not zero. No one has zero sovereign risk, but minimal sovereign risk, which makes us a reliable supplier as we go back and talk about supply chain resilience. And I think that we also have, particularly within our minerals and minerals processing in industry, um, a, a, a really advanced safety culture I mean, it's one of the reasons why the minerals industry has been able to continue through the COVID-19 pandemic, because we've all got excellent safety systems where we've been able to drop the new health and hygiene requirements into. But we also have very much a mindset of improvement, um, of continuously improving our ability to deliver not just quality product, but to continue to drive costs down. So I think Australia has a lot to offer the world in this area. And I think it has as much to do with the way that we approach our business and, and, and our opportunities as it does even about the quality of our resources. Well, well thank you for, for framing Australia's role in the context of, of the supply chains and supply chain resilience that we've already been talking about. Uh, if I understand correctly, Linus has, has uh, uh, supply chain nodes in Australia and Malaysia already, and you you're have plans underway to open up facilities in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit about the benefits of, of doing something in the United States 
obviously all our attention this week has been on the US elections, but there is underlying business as well. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the benefits of that global network approach, uh, in particularly with uh, the potential of a, a presence in the US. So, so once again, just thinking about this, um, we never use the nine letter C word in our business, commodity, right? Uh, because our, the materials that we produce are functional materials which actually make a difference to the way that the finished product forms. And when you're selling functional materials, it's a good thing to be operating closely with your customers. And so once again, as sort of an overarching frame, our view is that it makes sense for our upstream processing to be close to the resource. So this minimizes costs and for our downstream processing to be close to the customer. And so our current configuration has certainly worked very well for us in terms of having downstream close to our East Asian customers, particularly our Japanese customers. Um, but you know, we see that there is an opportunity to, to, to grow that industrial footprint. And particularly, as I explained earlier, the importance of heavy rare earths, but we know that the reliable supply of raw materials, we'll see people thinking more about them and formulating them more. And we've seen that in Japan. So the Japanese uh, demand and rare earth processing industry has grown by about 80% since 2013. And that's been off the reliable supply from Linus. So we see the opportunity, whilst I'm usually not a build it and they will come sort of a person, we do see the opportunity that by establishing that footprint in, in the US where we know people are innovative and creative, that we think that there will be further downstream development in the US and that will give us a strong position within that supply chain. You know, uh, here in Western Australia in particular, uh, the notion that there's a nine leather C word commodity would probably shock some folks, but I do really appreciate how you, you made it clear that rare earths shouldn't be perceived simply as a mining industry, that they also play a key role in enabling new technologies and digital scientific events, clean energy sectors, et cetera. Um, so if indeed that your, your diversified presence or nodes is about being near the down, so downstream usages of rare earths in, in those sectors, can you just give us a sense for uh, what technological opportunities you think are there from having a downstream in the US or, or of course your, your customers here. What are the technological opportunities that can be built from, from a more resilient rare earth supply chain? Sure, um, and it's not just the US by the way, the EU is very interested as well and the EU is a very large user of magnetic materials. I guess the first thing that I would say is that we uh, very much see ourselves as a rare earths company. Sometimes other projects will talk about just NDPR, you know, and they're just about magnetic materials. And the market is growing and there's enough to go around. There needs to be more development of metal making and magnet making capability. Um, a, a, a close and ready supply source for that is really important. Once you have the magnets, then the further downstream business continues to grow. So if Tesla, for example, had uh, confidence in a local supply of magnets, might they build their new factory in the US instead of China? Maybe. If, if Apple had confidence, might they actually you know, produce more of their materials in the US than, than in China? So um, I, I think in all of the sectors, these are all, as I said right at the beginning, growth sectors, right? So this is not about we don't have to say we're going to eat somebody else's lunch here, right? There's enough growth to go around, but what we need is uh, conditions which encourage others to invest in those downstream areas and a ready source of responsible raw materials, we believe will facilitate that. As a, as a think tank, the Perth US Asia Center really attempts to bring together scientific perspectives, academic perspectives, private sector perspectives, uh, and, and then to work together then with, again, military, but primarily trying to get government to kind of focus on these issues. 
uh, you will know well our director of research, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Wilson, who's, who's been on a crusade of sorts for, for years now on critical materials, rare earths in particular. Uh, and he was the leading uh, driver behind our In the Zone conference last, last uh, year. But part of his focus is, is getting governments to pay more attention. It does seem that recently governments are, are beginning to take more purposeful action. Uh, this year alone, we've seen new policies out of, of the US, out of Japan, out of the EU, all aimed at supporting the development of a more secure supply chain of critical materials. I'm curious as to your, your, your scorecard. How do, you, how do you view these efforts and, and, and what more needs to be done to advance this critical agenda, not just for Linus, but for the broader uh, industry of critical materials rare earths? So we absolutely welcome the fact that governments are recognising this is an important area to address. But, but frankly, uh, without meeting to preconditions in terms of actions, it is just rhetoric. And, you know, I, I, I did actually count up at one stage. I think that there have been something like 13 or 14 joint communiques between Australia and the US. Um, and there has been one small you know, pro, uh, contract um, uh, let to us in the US in terms of development. So we see that it's very difficult for Western governments dealing with um, a market where the dominant player has set economic conditions to ensure that suppliers are, are favoured uh, economically, uh, are able to compete uh, uh, on an unlevel playing field in terms of pricing, um, are given other incentives or are indeed state owned without a profit motive. And Western governments really like to say we're going to leave it to the market to look after it you know and actually if your primary competitor does not have the same ethos then they will beat you every time they will beat you so when we talk to governments we talk to them about what can they do in terms of the things that government is good at, you know, infrastructure, process, you know, we do things like, for example, we already provide rebates on diesel, for example, to ensure that, you know, uh, rural and remote um, agricultural producers are not disadvantaged. I mean, there are other opportunities for governments to really look at what's the economic framework and are we putting a framework in place that allows our producers to be successful, particularly when we're dealing with, um, you know, a control economy as opposed to a free economy. Um, for example, you know, in, in China, there is a value added tax of 13% on light rare earths and it is not rebated until the magna. So therefore, anyone outside China that did want to buy, say, an oxide to use in a magnet making um, uh, facility out of China will pay 13% more than uh, an in, inside China producer. So there are these sorts of things where, you know, unless they are addressed and, and more actively than generally speaking, Western governments um, feel comfortable to do, it will continue to be very difficult for um, Western producers to be successful. And of course, the other thing, which I also mentioned earlier, is ultimately markets are determined from the demand side, not from the supply side. And so unless users outside of China change their behavior and don't choose a solution just because the magnet is, you know, a dollar or two dollars a kilo cheaper from a Chinese supplier, which frankly in a $50,000 car is neither here nor there. Uh, unless they change and say it matters to us that we have an alternate source and that we have uh, responsible production, then um, ultimately it will be difficult. 
I, I recall one of the themes at our, our large conference on critical materials last year was not just the security of supply chain that we've talked a lot about, but the integrity of that supply chain. And it's a wonderful way for us to kind of wrap up the conversation. I, I can't help but reflect that in the year since you were here for that conference in, in Perth, uh, we've seen you know, a bushfires, a heavy focus on climate change, a global pandemic, resultant economic impacts from that ongoing trade war with, with China, and this intense interest, obviously, in the American election. And for a story like this to kind of burst through that overlay of, of big issues indicates its importance. I would note that I think just a month ago, I saw that former U.S. Uh, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis authored a, an op-ed uh, in, in Bloomberg News highlighting this issue. I know that my team at the Perth U.S. Asia Center is keenly interested in it. So I anticipate that whatever the rest of 2020 holds for us as we finish up this year and we go forward in the next year we'll continue to focus on critical materials because they are indeed critical uh and uh, uh and in that we're we're pleased to have had this conversation with you and we look forward to continue to work forward uh, with you on this issue both for the sake of of western australia to australia more broadly regional supply chains and the full range of of, of potential technologies uh, uh, that you discussed uh, with us during the course of this call. So thank you, Amanda. I really appreciate the conversation. That, that, thank you, Gordon. And can I just say in, in conclusion, it's actually, despite all those things, been a very good year for Linus. Uh, we continue to drive our business forward and, and, and we look to the future and greet the future with actually a great deal of optimism. Well, that's what we needed. We needed some bright spots in 2020. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.